All right, so I've been producing music for over 13 years in a home studio. I've done everything from producing artists to music for film to making custom music for commercials. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. Here are 30 production tips that will help you almost guaranteed. It's gonna be extremely fast. We're gonna get right to the point and this is in no particular order. Number one, invest in sound libraries before investing in effects plugins. If you want professional sounding music, then get access to professional sounding sounds. Like more EQs and compressors will not impact your music as much as having very good sounds. Number two, if you are recording live instruments, please do not record cheap sounding instruments. Like it's like sound libraries, cheap instruments simply sound cheap. I'm not saying go buy a $2,000 guitar, but just make sure that the instrument actually sounds great. For example, I never record my upright piano because it just doesn't sound good enough to actually record with as much as I would love to. Number three, if you are in a bedroom studio without professional acoustic treatment, then record your vocals with either a dynamic mic like a Shure SM7B or the Loudon LS208, which is a condenser mic that actually behaves more similarly to a dynamic mic. Typical large diaphragm can condensers are simply too sensitive for rooms that are not at least somewhat treated and will likely cause more problems. Number four, invest in good acoustic treatment. It, it solves literally so many problems. Like this previous tip is a good one to use a different mic, but if you want those crystal clear vocals, then working in a great sounding room helps immensely. And not only that, but listening to your tracks through monitors will actually sound how it should. If you use monitors in an untreated room, then you are not hearing a good representation of how it'll actually sound. Number five, the most important tool in mixing is not EQ. It's not not compression and it's not reverbs and delays. It's the fader. Plain and simple, like so many problems in bedroom producers mixes are simply volume problems more than anything. Get your volumes adjusted and set up before adding in other effects. You'll get so much further if you actually spend a good amount of time dialing in your volumes. Number six, the fastest way to decide how loud or how soft something should actually be, no matter what it is, is to turn the volume till it's clearly too loud, turn it back down till it is clearly too quiet and then split the difference and you will be in the right ballpark. This works works on effects too. So if you're trying to decide how much reverb on a vocal, for example, do this. If you're trying to figure out how loud the drum should be in relationship to everything else, do this. Trust me, works 93% of the time. <laughs> If you know, you know. Common if you know. Number seven, if you want your vocals to feel bigger, then a reverb trick is to use two separate reverbs, each on an individual bus. One reverb is a longer reverb, like say two to three seconds, depending on what you're going for. This other reverb is gonna be a smaller room that is under one second. The smaller reverb is gonna give the vocal the feeling of more width. Now just be careful not to overdo it because if it's too loud, it will sound weird. Number eight, this might sound weird, but if you are recording vocals on the word I, like I love you, and you need it to be softer, try putting a bit of a breath before the I, almost pronouncing it more like hi. Now, obviously, I want to be careful. You don't want to accent this too much. Here's actually an example of this being used in one of my tracks. I will fight for you. Will you fight for me? I will hold you to the darkest hour. This makes it sound a lot less like accented and actually works like magic. Number nine, don't be afraid to boost frequencies. So many YouTube videos talk about subtractive EQ, which is cutting frequencies, but a lot of them make it out like additive EQ is this bad thing, and this is not true at all. I boost frequencies all the time. My favorite is to boost in the 6K range on vocals that need more crispiness, and I personally love using more vintage style EQs to do this, but you could also use plugins like Fresh Air or Oxygen. Number 10, if you struggle with programming drums, then you should pull drum loops into your DAW that are really close to what you want and then program to that loop. This not only helps you make that loop your own and customize it, but it will also help you to start to learn each time you do this what works, what doesn't work, which will then help you come up with your own drum patterns without using loops. You're welcome. Number 11, if you have a vocal part that is extremely dynamic and goes from normal volume to very loud in the same phrase, rather than like pulling away from the mic like this, this is like what a lot of singers do, instead try just turning your head at a 45 degree angle instead. This actually allows the mic to still capture the same frequency range because you the same distance from the mic, but it's not gonna pick up as much of that volume change quite as much. If you pull away from the mic like most people do, it's gonna lose some of that mid-range and it's gonna sound different. This is the workaround. Now, another option is to actually place the mic higher so it kinda comes down at a 45 degree angle above your mouth. You can do that as well, that's a secondary option. Number 12, let's just clear the air here. When you record literally anything, you should be aiming to stay under minus six dB when you record. Now, this is not like a black and white rule, but it is a really good guideline until you can understand when and why you may want to go above that. Like for example, if you're 
pushing compression or saturation with analog gear, uh, you might do that. But just aim to stay under minus 60 B because this is basically gonna guarantee that you are not recording too hot. It's always better to be safe than sorry. Number 13, a quick trick I use to know if my arrangement is sounding interesting or boring is to scrub the timeline by skipping about 15 to 20 seconds ahead and playing it back every single time I skip ahead. If it sounds too much the same throughout the track, that's a very good indicator that I need to try to find other ways to differentiate the entire arrangement. I do this in our weekly feedback sessions in my program, Producer Accelerator, and many of my students are pretty blown away at how simple of a trick this is. And if you realize like, wow, this does not sound interesting throughout the entire song, and you need to rework that arrangement. Oh, and if you wanna check out the course, I have a completely free workshop that you can check out. I have a link in the description down below. Number 14, this is a songwriting tip, but for real, some of my best song ideas hit me at the most random times. So make sure you have a good recording app on your phone to document ideas. And literally, I just sing them into my phone. I'll pull them into my DAW to flesh out later. I just, I hate having ideas and then forgetting them, right? Because I don't have a way of capturing them. And this does happen all the time. So I have my Voice Record Pro app ready for new ideas as they hit. You can really use any app. This is just what I use. As long as I can get the gist of the song, it's good enough for me. So don't let your great ideas be forgotten. Number 15, if you feel stuck while producing, honestly, get outside and take a walk and spend time simply allowing your imagination to run. Play the song in your head away from the computer and let your mind problem solve without the computer in front of you. Like the number of times I've done this and come back feeling immensely refreshed and ready to go. And in many cases, actually knowing exactly what moves to make, it's actually a lot. So just never underestimate taking a break and giving your mind freedom to wander. Number 16, the biggest mistake I hear with kick drums when giving feedback to my students is kick drums that have a lot of top end pop, like they, they pop through the mix, but not enough low end thump. If you're struggling with getting great sounding kicks, just be aware that a great kick sound, it's gonna have both a nice top end to cut through the mix, but also that low end thump. Obviously this is gonna depend on genre. If you can't get all of that from one kick sound, then try layering two kicks together and make sure they complement each other. In other words, one has the top end part and the other has the thump. Basically don't reach for EQ to fix that problem. Just get better sounds working for you. Number 17, if you wanna produce music faster, then try setting a timer for one hour and commit to producing as much as possible within that time limit. This actually forces you to stop worrying about mundane details that really only make a 1% difference and instead lets you focus on making big moves and doing those first. Because the truth is that, especially if you want a career in music doing this, producing music fast is essential. Like the faster you can produce, the better you're gonna be at it. Making a career as a producer honestly requires you to be able to work very fast. Like heck, I had a day and a half to score a commercial last week and if you can't write and produce very fast, then those types of gigs are not possible. Number 18, if you want those huge pop vocals, then the way you do this is by recording your lead vocal and then recording two other vocals exactly the same and paying them hard right and hard left. The goal with this is to perform the doubles as close to the original as possible. This adds that huge element. You can do this as many times as is necessary for the track. Like sometimes I'll do this four times, like four doubles. Sometimes I'll do two doubles and then two others that are either an octave up or an octave down to actually accent that melody. Like basically most pop, EDM, and even rock nowadays has huge vocal production. So if you want that sound, it's all about vocal layers and doubling. Just never copy and paste a vocal and call it a double. That doesn't actually work. Number 19, be very careful not to overload your low end when you're producing. Like the only elements that should really carry the low end is your bass and your kick and, and not really anything else. This doesn't mean that you need to cut the bass out of everything, but it means that when you are arranging, you should be very aware that you should not be overloading the lower elements. The lower the range, the fewer elements that there need to be. And as you start going up in the range, you can add more without having a clutter issue. Now, this has actually everything to do with the harmonic series, which I'm not gonna really get into because it's complicated, but basically it's science. Number 20, when you are producing music, never underestimate how much transitional elements can add into the track. Like listen to this example without transitional elements. And now listen with transitional elements like cymbals and some almost riser-esque sounds. It makes a really big difference. And you don't need to copy this specific thing, but basically don't underestimate how much transitions can impact your music. I almost always try to work hard on my transitions because it can add so much life to the music. Number 21, so many producers copy MIDI regions from track to track. So if you have chords, you may just copy those chords from one track to another. And this, in my opinion, is rather lazy and it's not gonna make for very interesting sounds. Instead, try using different inversions of chords from track to track. So if you have piano chords, then try using the same chords, obviously, within the progression, but use different inversions or voice 
voicings in like the synth part or the string part or whatever part it is to make it more unique. Because this means you're actually adding new notes into the production instead of just copying them. Trust me, this is gonna make your music sound much more interesting. Number 22, okay, trigger warning. Okay, maybe not. But for real, learn music theory. So many people have this idea that theory will somehow restrict their creativity. And to be totally frank, that is really dumb. And the only people saying this are people who don't know theory. So that's, that's kind of odd. Like I've never met anyone who knows theory saying, dang, like I really wish I didn't know this. Like, I mean, just think about it for two seconds. That's like an architect saying, dang, I wish I didn't know math. It's so creatively limiting. But for real, learning basic music theory is arguably one of the most valuable things you could possibly learn. I'm not talking about learning scientific theory or super mathematical theory like universities are teaching, but basically learn how chords work. Learn how chords interact with each other. Learn chords, voicings, and harmony, and melody. How to wield music, because music theory to me is just understanding how music works. If you don't understand how music works, then how can you expect to make great music? Number 23. I don't talk about mixing a lot on this channel, but this one is a really great tip. If you want more loudness from your track, try using clipping and not just limiting. Essentially, clippers are going to shave off the loudest parts of the transients. And this works best on drums, especially because, you know, snares, for example, are going to have a very loud burst of the transient. It's going to make it so that your limiter is not having to work quite as hard, which means it's going to give you a more natural sound and also allow you to push your volume much louder. I've been using the Black Salt Audio Clipper, and my goodness, it's, it's really easy to use. I absolutely love it. It's been a long time since I found like a really super simple plugin that I actually really love. I love this thing. I've been using it on every single production I work on lately. I'm getting louder mixes with way less effort. If you want specific tutorials on using clippers, then Hardcore Music Studio channel talks about it. He's also the creator of that plugin. And also Streaky has a great channel talking about that stuff as well. Number 24. This is more practical than anything, but make sure that if you are working on revisions of a production that you either save a copy for every revision, or if you're using Logic, use project alternatives. If you're working for clients or even your own music and you have multiple revisions, but you want to be able to access those older versions and make sure you are saving every version as its own production. In a commercial that I just got done scoring, we've already had like six different project alternatives because there have been several rounds of revisions and we ended up actually using two different ones so the ad agency had options. And as I'm making this video, we're in the process of the next round of revisions for the final three. So if you're just changing the one production, you cannot go back to older versions. Trust me, nothing is worse than a client saying, hey, can we go back and use a version two? And then version two is now totally gone because we're on version 10. Number 25, don't be afraid to bail on a production. Now, obviously, if you're working on paid projects, you can't do this, but I know so many producers who are gonna hang on really tightly to a production, even though they know it's not good work. I'm obviously a very big advocate for finishing songs, but sometimes you need to give yourself permission to say, you know what, this is not going well, and I'd rather direct my creative energy into something that I know will go well. Our creative energy is really limited, so why would you waste it on something that you literally know is not good work? Again, I'm not saying bail on stuff because you don't feel like it, but I had a track I started a couple weeks ago that I was rolling with, and after a little bit, I realized, like, this just isn't very good work. It's not worth my time to finish. So I stopped, and I worked on something else, and I have no plans to return to it. So don't make this a habit where you're just trashing work when you should be finishing it, because this is a balancing act, and be truly honest with yourself about it. Number 26, on the opposite of this previous one, finish your songs, like for real. If you know you have a great sounding production, just freaking finish it. Like so many producers have like 100 songs that all sound awesome, but have 5% more to finish. So there you go, finish the songs, just finish them. Don't let all those songs sit on your hard drive because you can't muster up the energy to do the last 5% or heck, just call them done. Forget the last 5%, release it, publish it, whatever you gotta do, just finish your song. The number of producers out there that could legit have a career, but don't because they never finish anything, it's staggering. Number 27, if you wanna make a living as a producer, then stop making it about you. This might be hard to hear, but we are service providers in most cases. Yes, our services are creative, but ultimately, if you want a career, then you need to make it about serving clients and not serving yourself. Like, if you just want to serve yourself, then make it a hobby and nothing else. If you want to put food on the table, then start seeing yourself as a solution to someone else's problem. Artists need great production. You can solve that problem. TV shows need great music. You might be able to solve that problem. Production houses need talented composers and producers to score commercials really fast. You can solve that problem. You get the theme here? Stop making it about you and start making it about solving someone else's problem. And you will get much further in life. And I'm not saying that solving someone else's problem can't also serve you. You can have them both. It, they, it can work together, but your focus needs to be on serving your clients. Man, that kind of just became like life advice right there. Pretty good. Number 28. If you don't know if your arrangement is too dense or not, try this. Try muting elements you feel may not be necessary and really feel 
how it impacts the track. If you can hardly tell the difference on the track at all, just mute it and keep it muted. Delete it. Just remove it. The truth is that you do not need as much stuff in your production as you think you do. Like when you see productions with 100 tracks, that's not 100 tracks happening all at once. It's usually like 50% drums and vocals, and then the other 50% is things that are coming in and out. It's rarely ever happening all simultaneously. So if you have parts that feel unnecessary, try just muting them, seeing how much of a difference it makes. You will find that often you can remove a lot of stuff you just do not need because it doesn't even make a difference. Your audience won't be able to tell that you have an insanely quiet, like little plucked arp thing happening in the distance. Just delete it. Number 29, if you want your reverbs and delays to sound more interesting, then make sure you put them on an effects channel or bus. Then after the reverb or delay, you can now add additional processing that only impacts the effects. So a lot of times I like delays that are really crunchy and distorted. So I'm going to actually add distortion after the delay to really make that effect sound much more unique and interesting. You don't need to just add like a single effect and then call it a day. You can actually add effects to effects to make it sound more awesome. Number 30, remember to have fun. Like even if you want a career and are aspiring to more than a hobby, it doesn't matter. If you're not having fun making music, then why are you doing it? This should be enjoyable. Like I understand it can be frustrating and it 100% can be. Like I've had times that I'm frustrated, but in the end, I absolutely love doing this and it is so sinking fun. I honestly sometimes don't even believe that I get to do this for a living, that I get to work from home making music and making these videos. So whether you want a career or not, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you're having fun. Early on in my career, I was saying yes to work that I just did not enjoy and I had to learn how to say no to things because they were simply not enjoyable for me to do. So now I'm only working on projects that generate true excitement. Learn to draw your boundaries and have some fun. Comment below which one of these tips you found the most helpful. If you think this video is good, I think you're gonna like the rest of my videos and especially this one right here if you wanna learn how to produce much faster. I'll see you in that video.